Welcome back to the Holiness of the Lord. And this time, on Sunday, I was listening to the BYU Religious Education Channel, which kind of just summarizes and goes over interesting articles and studies that professors at BYU have published in a podcast form that just makes it easy to engage with and digest what they are talking about. And so this is a 20-minute section from an episode, episode 74, Defining Church Doctrine, that I thought was really insightful, and it's really nice to know that somebody's going out and digging through, you know, the, the 75 years of general conference talks we have on how one defines doctrine and bring the results. So I thought it was a really good discussion. Here's a clip of it, and I highly recommend going and checking out the whole thing. Can you walk our listeners through some of these passages that you alluded to and maybe give us a sense of this pattern where you see this uh, kind of co-eternal nature of God and truth together in Scripture? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Book of Mormon does something very interesting. It equates God's Godhood with his um, living true to truth or eternal law. As you and I know in, in the Scriptures, both in Alma and in Ether, it says, Yeah, I, Lord, I know that thou speakest truth, for thou art a God of truth. And speaks of if God were ever to go contrary to the nature of God, uh, nature of truth, excuse me, yeah. that he would cease to be God. Now, that's, that's a profound statement, making that connection. Then if you go to Doctrine and Covenants 93, it speaks about truth as a name for God. And I thought that's profound. In verses 8 and 9, it says, Therefore, in the beginning, the word was... For he was the word, obviously speaking of Christ, even the messenger of salvation. Verse 9, the light and the redeemer of the world, the spirit of truth. And and the connection, I think, as you go through the scriptures, you see that, that God is the only being who is capable of knowing all truth. Therefore, if we would know truth in its fullness, it is only knowable in relationship to God. And that's the, that's the construct I was trying to get to there. Yeah, very well said. Thank you. Uh, and then in the next section, you connect to truth and then introduce this idea of doctrine and talk about the role of prophets. And so let's, let's jump to that now. Uh, in it, you write, Latter-day Saints differ from most other Christians in believing that God continues to reveal truth. Uh, to living prophets. Joseph Smith stated that it is through this priesthood or prophetic channel that all knowledge, doctrine, the plan of salvation, and every important truth is revealed from heaven. Maybe unpack that and theological implications that you see as we talk about truth in the role of prophets. Thank you. Absolutely. So, so if God is the ultimate source of truth, and if truth cannot be fully understood without God, then we have to ask ourselves, where and how does God give that truth to us? Which, of course, we would hopefully turn towards the concept of revelation. Um, and e even God himself, the script, uh, it's been said about God, Bruce R. McConkie actually said that God either, either stands revealed or stands concealed. I'm using my own words there. In other words, that you cannot know God if he doesn't reveal himself. Well, if that's true, the question becomes, how does God reveal himself to us? And, I, and I'd hope we would understand that there's at least two mechanisms for that. One would be personal revelation, but the other is through prophetic revelation. And so prophets aren't the arbiters of truth, and yet prophets are the ones whom God is is revealing truth to. Therefore, we basically come to understand truth as God reveals it through his prophets, uh, which, which leads to a couple very important questions and issues. We in the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints don't believe in, in prophetic infallibility. We don't believe that, that prophets are perfect. And so we have multiple statements from prophets who are, who are making that statement themselves. It's not just us making that. And yet you have statements like Joseph saying, yet there's no error in the revelations that I've given. Uh, and Wilford Woodruff's famous statement that God would not allow us to lead the people astray. And so you, you have to take both of these strands and pull them together and say, okay, we don't believe in prophetic infallibility, yet we believe that God works through prophets and expects us to heed and understand the words of those prophets. And so prophets become a, a very important means by which we can discern truth, which only God is able to reveal. And, and that sort of leads to, I mean, really the, the bulk of this study that you've done, where 
um, you you talk about the definition of uh, of doctrine, and and in some in some circles, doctrine is just synonymous with a teaching, right? This is a doctrine; it's a teaching. And yet, in the article, you write defining doctrine as simply any religious instruction leaves many modern members unable to differentiate between a teaching that's considered authoritative and a teaching that is simply the best understanding of a person speaking. And that leads to your analysis of various ways that you've seen many of these church leaders uh, define doctrine and and ways that they've tried to help members gain a better understanding of this. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of set you loose to take us whatever direction you want uh, and maybe give us the, the, the backdrop. You mentioned this is a study that you've been doing for a number of years. Um, kind of take us take us through that. How um, what what did that study look like, and and what were some of your findings? Thank you. Absolutely. The I think what you said is so crucial, Ryan, is that we understand that the definition of of doctrine has varied from the days of Adam till today, from most of religious history, uh, at least in the in Christian history, and most of the restored gospels history truth, excuse me, doctrine literally meant teaching. Mm -hmm. As you said, it didn't talk about it, didn't necessarily mean authoritative or not authoritative. It was simply a religious teaching. But about 30, 40, almost 40 years now ago, there began to be some very distinct changes in how the brethren spoke about doctrine. That caught my attention. And I thought, hmm, I wonder. So I began to look at systems that people had uh, put together to understand what is doctrine, what is not in the church. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the other systems going forward. But I, I realized the reality is if we wanted to know how God is defining doctrine, if God does that through and with his prophets, we needed to know what the prophets were saying. I'm curious, um, you know, you mentioned you sort of saw that shift and saw doctrine spoken about in maybe a new or unique way. Uh, what did you understand in, in that moment? Like, what what did yeah. you identify? Was there a shift? Was there something that led to it? Were there any explanations given at the time? What I what I began to recognize was that that defining doctrine as any teaching was simply not taking care of the needs of the members at the time. In other words, it left members wondering, "Well, wait, is this is this something I can hang my hat on? Is this a a truth that is not going to change, or is this something that?" Maybe it was taught in the past, but it's going to be yeah. modified now and changed. And and what I began to see was the brethren began to narrow the definition of doctrine to make it more usable, uh, more helpful for members to be able to know what was happening, uh, what they can, what they could depend on, what they could rely on. Yeah. Um, so what I what I chose to do was do a systematic study of the word doctrine in general conference. So I, using some of the wonderful tools we had. Uh, did a systematic study of every mention of the word doctrine from 1850 till today. Mm. Uh, and what I saw for the first majority of the time was that doctrine, even if it was defined, it was basically defined as teaching till about 30, 40 years ago. And then uh, it began to become much more specific. And what I found was just, just in the last 30 plus years, there are over 2,000 references to the word doctrine in general conference. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can find patterns here. So I, I literally studied all 2,000 of the references. And as I did so, I did see a very clear pattern begin to emerge, ways that the brethren repeatedly defined doctrine, not just one person, but several people, and used different words. They weren't just copying from each other. And so what I began to recognize was whether they were being systematic about it or not, what came for the last 30 to 40 years was basically three criteria. Um, one is, is this teaching something that we consider to be eternal? Eternality is the word I use for it. Two, is it being taught regularly by the First Presidency and Quorum of Twelve? And three, is it salvific? Uh, meaning, does it have to do with our salvation? Um, and and I began to notice this again and again and again. and. As I as I did, and and I mean we could I could pull out quotes and and show you that it was just consistently spoken of. When I realized that, I began to use it as part of my own instruction in classes, um, not as my own system. One of the things I always tell my students, and I would say on this podcast, is that 
I don't think there's any such thing as the criteria for recognizing doctrine. There are several possible. This is the one that I found the brethren are continuing to speak of. And and since I finished the study, they're continuing to speak on it and using the same exact three. And so um, what I found in that is that the three criteria, is it eternal? Meaning when Adam was alive, would it be true then? How about when Christ was alive? How about when Joseph Smith is alive? How about Russell M. Nelson? If it changes, that doesn't mean that at the time it wasn't right, but it simply means you wouldn't you wouldn't hang the, the label doctrine on it. It's not unchanging. It's clearly. not unchanging. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And so that became the most common referenced definition for doctrine. Doctrine is that which is eternal and doesn't change. Joseph Smith, Boyd K. Packer, uh, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, uh, Elder Anderson, just multiples say, saying the same thing. Um, and that's helpful. They also often differentiated doctrine they they'd usually use two words doctrine or principles they they almost always overlap those and they would they would compare that to um, practices or procedures um, policies or procedures excuse me and they 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 juxtapose those doctrines and principles don't change you can hang your hat on those you can have faith in those policies and procedures not only might change sometimes by prophetic revelation, have to change. President Nelson's probably the <laughs> the greatest ex- example of that, right? So with that, we look and say, okay, is this an issue that has um, been consistently taught from the beginning? And also, are the brethren actually claiming this is an eternal truth? The fact that someone says that doesn't necessarily make it true, but you can go back and do a little historical look and say, yeah, there's not been much variation in this from from Adam and Eve forward. So that became important. Second criteria, united voice. Um, this united voice of the first presence in Quorum 12, sorry, I meant to clarify that. Um, I don't mean by that that there has to be an official proclamation. But if you've got one person or one or two people who have a topic and they hit it and you don't have others of the first presence in Quorum 12 jumping on, that doesn't mean that what they're saying is false but it doesn't have the added verification that we would expect from Doctrine and Covenants 107 that all decisions of this, these quorums should be unanimous, right? When you have something that the First Presidency and Quorum of 12 is regularly and consistently teaching, that increases the, the evidence that what you're looking at is a doctrine and, and not simply a, a teaching, a personal opinion of one person or the other. And so, again, that's something that's verifiable. We can go take a look and say, okay, here's a teaching Who's been talking about it and how have they been talking about it? And so we've got two criteria that are very, any member of the church can go and begin to use those. And, and then the third one, third one might be the most esoteric, the concept of salvific. In other words, it's not how many steps a, a Jewish person could take in their day. We would call that a policy or practice. But but is this a teaching that is necessary for salvation? Um uh, I don't know if we'd say growing a garden fits that, but we would definitely say eternal marriage fits that. What what I found is if we combine those three, don't don't separate, subdivide. Mm-hmm. If we if we look and ask, is it eternal or is it being claimed to it be eternal and hasn't changed? Is it being taught regularly by the first presence in Quorum of Twelve? And is it a teaching that is necessary for our salvation? Putting those three together is a profoundly helpful way to begin to gain confidence that, okay, this is a teaching that isn't just good, good for our day, but one that I can, I can have confidence isn't going to change. And, and Ryan, that, that becomes kind of one of the biggest issues here. One of the things that our youth and our, our ward, our members are trying to figure out is, okay, if, if, if something in the past was taught and then something changes, How do I know if what's being taught now might change? Those three criteria give us three explicit means by which we can look and say, not likely that that's so Jesus is a Christ. I think if you take a look at that, this is not going to be a hard battle to fight to say, okay, is is that an eternal doctrine? Has it been taught the same that we depend on the Savior for our salvation? Is it taught regularly by the first presidency in Quorum of Twelve? Is it salvific? We go, okay, I've got great confidence that 
Jesus being the Savior and our, our dependence on him will not change. That same process can be used with any topic. And, and it doesn't mean that we have a kind of a mathematical formula that we can say, okay, if A, B, and C adds up to this, we know that. But it provides increasing levels of surety, witnesses, multiple witnesses that what is being taught uh, is something that we can have confidence in. I, I love this kind of three, um, not not three steps, but the, these these three filters to use as we approach uh, doctrinal teachings, as we approach concepts, as we're studying topics, etc. And it it sounds wonderful, and it it sounds like okay, I can do that. I I can I can make that decision, and that will really help me identify the things that I can, uh, you know, hang my hat on. I'm guessing though it's not always that easy. So maybe Correct. maybe w- walk through with us. Um, w- what do you do when it becomes muddy? What do you do Thank when it you. becomes messy? How do we how do we use what you're providing, which I think is really helpful, with some things that that don't feel quite that clean? Thank you. Really, really important here because again, I don't believe this is an algebraic formula. It's not a mathematical formula. Uh, life is just a smidge more complicated than that. So, so let me give you a couple examples. We absolutely positively believe that the atonement of Jesus Christ is a doctrine of the church, eternal, uh, taught regularly, and salvific, correct? So we know the atonement is a, it fits perfectly with what the brethren are saying is a doctrine. We also know that there are multiple theories, both scriptural, prophetic, and secular, as to how the atonement happened. We also know that the atonement is made up of, at least partially, practices or actions. So Christ did something in a specific t- place, in a specific time. And so if you put all that together, you say, okay, but if it's got practices, does that mean it's not a doctrine? Or, or if this prophet thought it worked this way and that prophet thought it worked that way, does that mean it's not a doctrine? And that's where we have to We have to be honest with the amount of material we can have confidence in. We know we are dependent on Christ's atonement, whether it's substitutionary atonement or um, penal atonement or whatever the theory is, we don't have as much confidence in that. So we wouldn't claim that to be doctrine. But the fact that we don't know how it works doesn't change the fact that we know not only does it work, it's necessary. Another simple example, plan of salvation, just keeping it big, the creation. We know that scriptures and prophets have taught from the beginning that God was the creator. Uh, we've, we know that that has been taught regularly by First Presidency and Quorum of Twelve forever, and that we can't be saved without being created and the earth being created. So we go, great, we've got a doctrine. How God created the world, how God created us, we don't have that kind of surety. We have a lot of thoughts. And some of those thoughts are for sure true. Some of them are for sure not. And so we we basically look at what, what how, how would I put this? What can we have confidence in based on those three criteria? I don't have confidence in the how of the creation because they don't fit those three criteria. I have tremendous confidence in the in the creation, God being the creator, and our need for that for our salvation. So, so basically, it, it helps us to be careful not to overgeneralize. Helps us to be careful not to overclaim, um, and that's true not just for big picture things like um, the plan of salvation, but aspects of sexuality and gender and and word of wisdom and other things. We can take a look and say. Look at those three criteria. How does it fit? How does it work? What can we claim? What shouldn't we claim? And by doing that, it enables us to basically uh, establish firm ground under us. And and I'd add one more thing. I, I don't want to conflate truth and doctrine. All doctrine is truth, but not all truth is doctrine. Um, policies, For instance, policies can be revealed directly from God. God can say, I want this done and I want it done now. But next 
generation, he's, he might say, I don't want. So, so a, a, if you are a Jewish individual back in the days of uh, Moses or, or, or even in the days of Christ, the way you would commemorate the atonement would be to take a little lamb and slice its throat and put it on an altar and burn it. And that became a, a, a practice with which we would commemorate and bind ourselves to Christ. Christ came and said, we're not going to do that kind of sacrifice anymore. So now we do what we would call the sacrament. That change was brought about by God. So we wouldn't say the move from sacrifice to sacrament is not true because it changed. We would simply say it was a policy or a practice to start with. And so I think we got to be really careful not to claim simply because something is changeable that is not true. But by being able to look at what is unchangeable, it gives us the foundation. So for instance, the atonement is the founding doctrine of the sacrament or the sacrifice. It's the atonement that doesn't change. The practice may, may and, and sometimes has to change. <laughs>